This is a story by Joseph Marshall from the dance house called When the Grasses Talk. During my youth, one of my favorite places was a bluff overlooking the Little White River, which my grandfather always referred to as the Smoking Earth River, sometimes correcting me when I called it the Little White River. That bluff was about 80 feet above the water at a bend that turned north west eastward. The Little White River flowed north and eventually emptied into the Big White River. My grandmother's half section was on the flats to the south and above the river with the northeastern corner, a long stone's throw from the, that bluff. The bluff was gray shale, crumbly and hard to climb, which I didn't often do. Instead, I preferred to sit on the edge of it, looking up and down the valley for miles. The river was a bright ribbon on the floor of the wide valley. For some strange reason, on cloudy days, it seemed even brighter than it did under clear skies, taking on a silvery appearance. The valley itself also looked different from day to day and from season to season. Although my favorite season is winter, I was always awestruck by the colors in late September and early October, when cottonwood, oak, ash, elm, chokecherry, plum, and willow leaves turned yellow, red, and purple. Sitting on the bluff, I would admire the splashes of color against the yellow grasses of the valley floor and listen to the grouse drumming and dancing on the prairies behind me. During such moments, I felt so alive and imagined even the trees were dancing. How can anything not dance when wearing so many colors? I would wonder, that portion of the Little White River Valley, several miles in either direction from that bluff, was my playground, my proving ground. As a boy, I wandered over about 150 square miles, mostly on foot, sometimes on horseback, and always with at least three dogs. In early August of this year, I spent a day on the remaining quarter section of my grandmother's land, crossing an old fence to walk to the bluff where I sat with my feet over the edge. As a hot sun beat down with a playful breeze providing some relief, I turned loose my boyhood memories, wave after wave of them. Like Lakota warriors riding over the crest of a hill, yet as I lost myself in those memories, tugged by one and then another, there was more, one more persistent than in others. Perhaps it was because my gaze had settled on a spot on the valley floor where at age six, I first noticed something unusual. That year, late spring was wet and the grass on the prairies was thick and tall, already knee high to a grown man in the little White River Valley. Sitting on the bluff one day, I noticed something curious across the river, three ovals where the grass was noticeably greener, as if a giant hand had drawn dots on the earth. The circles were in a triangular formation Two were in a straight north-south line, and the third was to the east of them. I thought that I knew every landmark in the valley from the vantage point of that bluff, yet here were three circles in the grass that seemed to have appeared overnight. Something eerie yet intriguing. My curiosity soon overwhelmed me. My apprehension and I waded across the river toward the grassy meadow with the circles. At ground level, the circles were not easy to see until I walked among them, discovering that they were about 15 feet in diameter and darker green than the surrounding grass. Going from circle to circle, I played a sort of connecting the dots game. That evening, I revealed the discovery to my grandparents. My grandmother smiled a little as she finished preparing supper. While my grandfather nodded knowingly, during the meal, he finally cleared his throat to speak. The last time I saw those circles was before you were born, he informed me. I was disappointed. I thought I had been the first to see the strange green circles. You saw them too, I asked. Seven years ago, it was a spring and summer with much rain like now. I can show them to you tomorrow. What are they? Lodge circles. Lodge circles, what are those? Places where lodges once stood. My disappointment was washed away by renewed curiosity. What lodges? Whose lodges? My grandmother smiled. Three, he replied, but I do not know who put them there. 
when I pers- when I persisted long ago came the patient reply. How do you know? The green grass, it grows where the picket pins from the lodges were pounded into the ground. I knew about lodges and about picket pins, which were short, thick stakes, usually made of ash or choke cherry, that were pounded into the ground to hold down the edges of lodge covers. I did not see picket pins in the grass, I said. They rotted a long ago, then fed the earth. The earth swallowed up the decayed wood. The grass is greener where the picket pins were once pounded into the ground. I was confused. What happened to the lodges? Taken down and loaded on drag poles behind a horse, my grandfather speculated. How do you know there were horses? The size of the lodges, they were large, he pointed out, holding out his arms wide. Before horses came to our people long ago, the lodges were the same, only smaller. They were small because they were carried by dogs. Dogs cannot carry big loads like horses can. There was a time when our people did not have horses. Yes, very long ago. I began to imagine a time when horses were not around. We had horses, two teams of big horses to pull the wagon and the plow and two smaller riding horses. In a moment, my thoughts returned to the lodge circles. Three lodges stood down there close to the river. Yes, the old man replied after sipping his wild peppermint tea. The people who put them there, who were they? He smiled. People with horses and three lodges, he said. A large family, maybe three families, added my grandmother, who had been listening with great interest. Families, how do you know that? The lodges, she replied. Men out hunting or going somewhere to make war do not travel with lodges. A group with women and children take along lodges. My other questions were quietly waved aside for the moment because there were chores to do. I had to haul water from the spring to the house and fill the wood bin next to the cooking stove. Tomorrow we will go to the river, promised my grandfather, and we will talk about the lodge circles. Being an impatient six-year-old, the night seemed much too long. Finally, the first hint of gray dawn light assured me that tomorrow had come and I left my bed. It was one of the very rare mornings when I was up before my grandparents. I built a fire in the cooking stove and put on a pot of water to make coffee, wondering if the grass circles would still be there. Somehow I refrained from mentioning them as the morning wore on, although my impatient glances toward the bluff certainly left no doubt as to what was on my mind. At mid-morning, when I had almost given up hope that my grandfather would go with me to the river and was nearly ready to go alone, I saw him grab his walking stick. Before long, we were on the bluff, and I was overjoyed to see the green circles in the grass. To my delight, there was something in my grandfather's demeanor that told me he also was excited to see the circles. I realized he was my connection to the land and to the past through all the stories he knew and loved to tell. If anyone knew anything about the circles in the grass, it would be him, and I was impatient to hear his story. We sat on the edge of the bluff as a breeze ruffled our hair. The air was cool with the promise of rain. What do you see from here, grandson, he began. I was elated, that was the question. In one form or another, he always asked when he began to tell stories about the past. I looked up and down the valley, the river, I replied, trees, hills, the meadow. Is that all? Yes. What about those two deer bedded down in that draw there, he said, pointing. What about those hawks building a nest in the tall cottonwood or that coyote on that hillside over there? I had not noticed any of those animals and decided I would never again believe the old man if he complained that this eyesight, that his eyesight was getting bad, which he did now and then. And there is much we cannot see. He went on, the insects in the grass, anthills, mole tunnels, meadow lark nests. Finally, he pointed to the circles in the grass. Six. Seven years ago, they were there just as they are now. The years in between were dry with not much rain. So the grasses could not tell their story. What? I stared at the tufts of grass nearby. I knew they couldn't talk, though I had heard the wind whispered through the blades of grass now and then. 
Grandpa, I ventured resol resolutely. I never heard grasses talk. That is true, grandson. They do not talk like you and me. But sometimes they have stories to tell. Everything has a story to tell if you know how to listen. My attention was fixed on the circles in the grass across the river. What do the grasses say? I asked. They say that someone was there. The old man pointed his walking stick down at the circles. Your grandmother was right. It was a family, perhaps a large one. Or maybe it was three families. Whoever they were, they pitched their lodges there. He lifted his stick toward a low butte on the opposite side of the valley. One I had climbed up a few times. From there, the old man continued, a person can see a long way off in all directions. From here to where we are. Suddenly I began to realize that the grasses were talking through my grandfather. Long ago, when those people came here and pitched their lodges, they picked a very good spot. I think that one of them climbed that butte. Another came up to his this bluff. Boys or maybe young men from those two places they could keep watch for enemies. Yes, for enemies. If any came, a warning signal of some kind, perhaps a fire arrow could be sent. One of the dogs accompanying us perked up her ears and wagged her tail. There was a soft rustling in the grass and without turning, I knew it was my grandmother. We waited while she seated herself next to me and took a deep breath. It was as if she had been listening to the conversation all along. If they were here in cold weather, that is the best spot to pitch lodges, she said. There is good shelter down there from the wind. There's dry wood all over, too, for the fires to cook with and keep warm, and grass for their horses. If it was winter, there is a young cottonwood all over. And you know how horses like to eat young cottonwood bark. Grandma, have you seen those before? I asked, pointing to the circles in the grass. Yes, many times since I was a young girl. This is my mother's land, she said, pointing back toward the half section on which we lived. She and her sister inherited it after my grandfather died. So I have lived here since I was just a girl. Every year there is a good rain. Those circles have appeared. I felt goosebumps on my arms and a chill went through me as I realized I was experiencing the same phenomena my grandmother had experienced during her youth, making my connection with her even stronger. Who were those people, Grandma? I asked, anxious to see more through her eyes. She shook her head slightly while shooing away gnats with her scarf. Draping the scarf over her neck, she tugged at her two long gray braids before she replied. No one knows, she said a little sadly, I thought. Over the years, your grandfather and I have talked about that. We know they had horses, as your grandfather said last night, because the three lodges were big. Since there were three, perhaps there were 12 people, maybe more. Were they all related, I wondered? Yes, I think so, she said, waving at the pesky gnats again. What were they doing? Where were they going? They had to be traveling north or south because they were following the river, pointing, pointed out my grandfather. Perhaps they were a family going to visit relatives somewhere, and they camped here for the night. Or they might have been banished, said my grandmother. Banished? Yes, she affirmed. One of them, a son or a father, might have done something very bad. Perhaps they killed one of their own people. For that, they would have been driven out or banished. Sometimes in the old days when that happened, a man's entire family went with him. Where to? Anywhere, so long as they stayed away from the rest of the people. That sounds lonely. It was. So if the people who came here were banished, they might have stayed here for a few days, maybe even a month or two. Yes, said my grandfather. The deer have always been plentiful around here. Only once during the time when the winds blew and the land turned to dust. The deer were few, but when there were when they were here, the hunting was good. Back then, there were bison here too. This is a good spot to stay, to hunt, and to make meat. So you think they stayed a long time down there? We do not know for sure, said the old man, but we do know they left in a hurry. They fled from something or someone. How do you know that, Grandpa? I asked in amazement. They left the picket pins behind in the ground. That means... They took down their lodges in a hurry. 
They had to move fast to get away. From what? Enemies, perhaps, said my grandmother. Maybe a grass fire or a flood, something that was dangerous. As I stared down at the circles in the grass again, I could see women pulling down the lodge covers and dismantling the lodge poles while men gathered their bows and arrows and all the horses. In my vivid imagination, the people had long black hair and brown skin and were dressed in tanned shirts, dresses, and sturdy elk hide moccasins. They worked quickly, folding the lodge covers and the dew liners, loading bundles, tying rawhide, cases of clothing and food into drag poles. There were two or three small children, I imagined, as well as two sentinels, sentinels, one on the far low butte and the other on the bluff where we sat, who galloped their horses to rejoin the group as it hurried away to the northeast. In my mind, they escaped from whatever, whatever enemy was approaching, and although I let them fade away, I would never forget them. Were they our people, I questioned, wanting to know more? My grandfather stared down into the valley as he slowly shook his head. I do not know, perhaps, he allowed. They could have been Cheyenne, they were here before us, or maybe they were Kiowa or Arikara. I thought the Kiowa and Arikara were our enemies. What would they be doing in our country? The Kiowa and the Cheyenne were here in the prairie country before our people came, pointed out my grandmother. The Cheyenne became our friends. The Kiowa moved away south because we were too many for them. The people who put up these lodges down there could have been here long before our people, the Lakota. It is hard to know for sure. Then it struck me that there was only one thing of importance. Someone was down there long ago. I said, that is true. So I do not think it matters if we know what people they were, said my grandfather. Again, he pointed his walking stick toward the circles in the grass. They were there. We will never know for sure who they were, their names, what language they spoke, or why they were there, but they were there. So when the grasses talk, you must listen and hear. They will tell you many things but the most important thing they will tell you is this. The land is old, very, very old, older than anyone can know and remember. When your grandmother and I are gone, perhaps you will be the only one to know the story of the circles in the grass. And after you are gone, who will know? I shook my head. The land will know and it will tell the stories if any two leggeds know how to listen. Grandfather was right. And I never forgot what he said that day about listening to the grasses. That year, the circles were clearly visible until midsummer. Then they faded as the grass on the river bottom grew thicker and the rains did not come as often. By autumn, I could not see them any longer, but I had seen those circles. I had heard the grasses talk. I knew part of the story they knew. The following year, when I was seven, they did not appear. The year after that, I was taken away to a government school and didn't return until the following summer. One summer, long after my grandparents had moved off the land, I did see the circles again, but I haven't seen them since. Perhaps I haven't been there at the right time or maybe the nutrients provided by the decaying picket pins have weakened and there will never again be circles where the grass is greener. In a sense, it doesn't matter because I know that they were there and I know the story they had to tell. Now, no one lives on my grandmother's land. All that is left of it is a quarter section, which is leased to a nearby rancher who runs cattle on it. I can't say what kind of connection he has with the land beyond its significance to him as a commodity, a way to fatten his cattle. The grasses have more stories to tell since the log house my grandfather built was torn down and hauled away. There are still slight depressions in the ground where the four heavy corner posts were. A few yards away are the scattered gray remains of a cottonwood tree he planted. Some of the pieces are in the depression where the root cellar was. About 50 or 60 yards away are a few bleached rib bones of a draft mare, which also tell a story. The horse fell on her back in a deep drift covering a narrow gully and unable to extricate herself, probably suffocated 
before she froze to death. My grandfather dragged what the coyotes had left back to the straw barn. 200 yards to the northwest in a deep gully, guarded by oak, elm, and ash trees, the water still seeps up out of the ground, the coldest, sweetest water I have ever tasted. There, my grandfather had dug a catch well and lined it with stones. The spring water seeped in and filled the well, and in it we dipped our buckets to fill the water barrel. Forty-four years later, the silt has filled in the well, but I know the stones are still there. If anyone were to remove the silt, my grandfather's catch well would function again. Of course, that individual would have to know exactly where the well was, would have to know the stories. This past August, I wandered over my grandmother's land for two days with memories and stories following me, swirling in my mind like a whirlwind. My grandparents are gone now, but as I stood on the site where the log house once was, their presence was as real as anything that I could see, hear, or touch. Because they had been there. They are a part of the stories now, mingling with all the others the land knows. Perhaps they now know who it was that came to that valley and pitched three lodges on the river bottom. On that visit, the circles in the grass were not visible. Perhaps it was too late in the summer, but they had been there and their story would live on. I don't know if those lodge circles will ever appear again, but I will go to that bluff and look for them as often as I can and listen to what the grasses have to say. The end.